Hello, everyone. We're so glad that you could join us today. I'm grateful for all of you. I know that, that many of you are disappointed that we're not getting back together in the next couple of weeks. I know that our elders have really anguished over these decisions and will continue to do so. They're trying to follow guidelines and they're trying to also honor God. And so please pray for them in these decisions and know that uh, it won't be very much longer that we'll be able to get back together and, and do all of our studies and worship times together live. In the meantime, we offer this opportunity uh, for you to have a time in the word. And I pray that this offering will be a good one for us all as we talk about worship and what it should mean to us. Before we begin, let's have a prayer together. Our Lord, thank you so much for bringing us together, for the opportunity we have to serve and honor you. Our prayer is that we will be able to uh, humble ourselves to you, that we will have a better insight into what worship is, and that we will take on the, the task of incorporating these ideas into our life, because Lord, you truly are worthy of our worship and I pray that we can be the people who respond to you as we should. Uh, give us your blessing tonight. Open our eyes and let your spirit speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are in the middle of a study that is based on a book, or at least the skeleton outline is based on a book written by a couple of authors named Mike Carlin and Stan Mosier, and the book is entitled Seven Words of Worship. A while back, I wanted to put together some ideas on worship. I decided I would look for some resource material of what other people were saying about worship. I ran across this book, and I thought it did a tremendous job of outlining some, some really fundamental and key ideas about worship. And I thought I would put it together in a class series. The authors have given us a definition of worship that I think is really a great place to start. It is worship is our response to God's revelation of who he is and what he has done. I believe worship is a response. It's a response to what God has done in our life. It's a response to who God is. And it's a response to so many different aspects of God's work in our life. Last week, we talked about the idea that we were created to worship God. Unfortunately, in our world, we have a very consumeristic view of God far too often. We have a, an idea that our walk with God should be about what he does in our life, that our relationship with God is about him meeting our needs. Unfortunately for us, if that's our viewpoint, we really do miss the point of what worship is supposed to be all about. Because you see, I believe that God has created man with an expectation of his creation to bring glory and honor to him first. As a matter of fact, in the Ten Commandments, the very first command is, I am the Lord your God. You shall have no other gods before me. Therefore, we talked last week about what it means to be created for God's purpose, that God has a great uh, idea in mind whenever he puts us on this earth. And we also talked about how the foundation of God's creation of us was for his pleasure. We were created to please God, and we were created to be only for God and no other gods, because as we read last week, God is a jealous God. And finally, we concluded that we were created to meet with God. God was not meant to be something that was out in the Netherland that uh, we, weren't, we weren't going to be able to have much access to. God wants to have us draw near to him, and we'll see that in the scriptures we read tonight. And in drawing near to him, we, as his creation, are to meet with him on a regular basis. And so that's part of why we were created to honor God. Now, beginning this week, we're going to look at the, or tonight rather, we're going to look at the second word of worship. And that word is grace. 
What is grace? And why is it so important? I want us to take a brief look at the idea of grace as found in the scriptures. And there are two biblical meanings to the English word that we translate grace. And the first of those biblical meanings is the one that we probably heard about the most. Grace is the unmerited favor of God, the most familiar definition of grace to most Christians. And there are a number of scriptures that we could turn to, but let's start in the book of Genesis, chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. And this is prior to the great flood. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals, and creatures that move along the ground, and birds of the air. For I am grieved that I have made them. But... Noah found favor, or as King James and other versions would say, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 3, beginning in verse 33, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. He mocks proud mockers, but he gives grace to the humble. The wise inherit honor, but fools he holds up to shame. Finally, we go to the New Testament, Romans chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. You see, grace is the unmerited favor of God. Therefore, it's not based on us qualifying for God. It's not based on us having the ability to impress God. It's not based on how many works we do or how often we show up at church. God's salvation to us is based on his love for us and the grace, the unmerited favor that he imparts upon us, and we are his recipients. Most of us really love the idea of this kind of grace. But there's another kind of grace that's found in the scriptures. And this kind of grace is the transforming power of God. Maybe you don't think about grace in these terms, but listen to what the scriptures say. In Romans 12, verses 6 and 7, Paul says, We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. So this is not the kind of grace that gives us the ability to have salvation. This is the kind of grace that gives us ability to serve and honor God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 7, I will always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. Unmerited favor of salvation? Tell me what you think. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 8, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that, and this is what the purpose of that grace is, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. One more, and this is Ephesians chapter 4, uh, beginning, or chapter 3 rather, beginning in verse 7. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all God's people, this grace was given me. What does this grace do? It's grace to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, which for ages was kept hidden in God, who created 
all things. The bottom line is this. Grace is the exercising of God's power over his enemy. He exercises his power over sin and its power by forgiving man in his grace through the blood of his sacrifice. And then he administers that power to men in his grace to defeat his enemy and his work in him. I want you to think about a statement. I want you to see if you agree or disagree with it. It's sometimes easy for people to accept one type of God's grace while neglecting to accept the other. It is sometimes easy for people to accept one type of God's grace while neglecting to accept the other. You see, there's a lot of people that really like the idea of salvation, and they really want God to forgive them, and, and they love, love it when they feel peaceful about things. But God's salvation in our life is just one form of grace. He also loves us enough that he gives us the equipment and the enrichment and the empowerment to be able to live our lives on this earth, to be able to be representative of him, to be able to walk through life confidently so that we don't have Satan's power dominating our life and we can give to other people the free gift which God gave to us. Consider what Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 through 10. Do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the Gospels. I want you to notice that the scriptures um, that we've read has given us an explanation of what happens when grace is given to us by God. I also want you to notice that all actions of grace are activities that involve God's power and God's influence. Grace gives to us blessing, salvation, and it gives to us God's presence. Grace is the power that defeats and destroys the power of sin and of death. Grace is the gifting of God's people to do God's work. And grace also gives to God's people worth, meaning, and purpose. You see, grace is God's life-changing gift to mankind. Grace not only brings salvation into our life, but it also transforms our life. And it, and it gives us God's image in our life. And it makes us useful in God's service. And it allows us to enter into the lives of others to make a difference. Now that we've said all that, how does grace influence our worship? Well, I want you to see what the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 22. Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we professed for he who promised is faithful and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good works. Notice that both kinds of grace are described here in this letter. We are not only cleansed from a guilty conscience and have, and have our bodies washed with pure water, that's the unmerited favor of God. But we also have a hope that we profess that we may spur one another on to love and good deeds. That is the transforming nature of God. The writer also says in 4.16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. While mercy and grace 
are two different things. They still go hand in hand. We receive mercy from God as he decides to forgive us our guilt. Praise God for that. We receive grace from God as he does this, but not only does he offer us forgiveness, he also offers us the empowerment that we need to be much more than just a forgiven entity. To accept God's grace into our life, then, is much more than waiting for God to give us a bath. It's also us pursuing these gifts that God gives to us all. It is us desiring to develop within ourselves the empowerment that he has decided to give to us. And that involves drawing near to God, who gives us both mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Worship, therefore, is our willingness and our response to the revelation that God is working in our lives through his grace. We don't just acknowledge God, but we seek God to find out what we, he wants us to do for him. Our faith in God gives us confidence that he is the one who will defeat his enemy through the power of his grace. And our worship is our drawing near to God because we have accepted this gifting and his calling to become agents of grace in this world. So when we teach, when we preach, when we serve, when we get involved in the lives of others, when we get involved in the administration of God's grace to others, we are worshiping him. You see, as we conclude, let's consider this. Grace from God is his way of connecting with us. We become free from guilt and shame. We get to enter into his holy presence. He then transforms us into something so different. It's described in the Bible as a new creation. And as we draw near to God, we're given salvation and gifts and confidence that we're going to be victorious. We're going to be successful as we walk in this life. We need to come close to God and we need to ask the hard and necessary questions. What would you have me do for you? And through humility and prayer and seeking and being willing and humble servants, we can begin to understand that God gives to us purpose, he gives to us the giftedness to fulfill that purpose. He gives us the protection that we need, and he gives us the success that we need all along the way. When we neglect to draw near to God, when we neglect to worship him because of this grace, then we neglect to find the mercy and the grace that we need. I know so many people that live a life that's just full of guilt, and it just wrecks their life. God's grace takes that guilt away, but not only does it do that, it gives to us such a meaningful life, such a purpose, that I think it can only be described as a great adventure with God. Next week, we're going to continue our study of the seven words of worship by talking about the final word, or not the final word, but the next word, I'm sorry, talking about the next word, and the next word is love. I know I look like an orangutan doing all this by myself, but y'all pray for me as I try to do these presenta presentations, and I hope and pray that this presentation has been a blessing to you today. God bless you all, and I hope to see you all soon. I love you.